The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Keep a moment of quiet as we bring to mind the ways in which we have failed God and failed our neighbour. And we pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy upon us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of of your your salvation salvation. through Through Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we come to the first of our readings, which... uh, Christine's going to read for us. Um, First reading is 1 Corinthians, verse 1, 18 to 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intellect I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded miraculous signs and Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preach God crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to join in the responses to this form of Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have called to you, Lord, Let your ears be open to my voice. My hope is in God's word. If you recorded all our sins, who could come before you? My hope is in God's word. There is forgiveness with you. Therefore, you shall be feared. My hope is in God's word. My soul is longing for the Lord more than those who watch for daybreak. My hope is in God's word. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. My hope is in God's word. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. My hope is in God's word. 
And now, Christine, if you would, our second reading. Second reading is from John, verse 2, 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all off at, and all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Judith, I think, is just... Oh, Judith, you're, you're back with us. Oh, thankfully, yes. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Have I managed to miss the slot for the sermon? No, you've just come at the perfect time. Oh, right, right. So is this the sermon slot? Yes, now? please. OK. <laughs> well, um, sorry about that. <laughs> it was not me, needless to say. Mm. So let's just keep a moment of quiet, <laughs> or for me to keep a moment of quiet. So may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us are being, who are being saved, it's the power of God. I think it's in Lent above all that we realize the disparity between our way of looking at life as Christians and that of the world in general. For I suspect if you ask most people today, they would likely agree with Peter in his protest that, as we heard last week, Jesus shouldn't suffer and die, with Judas, who perhaps had expected Jesus to lead an uprising against the Roman occupiers of Israel, and with all the disciples who walked with Jesus but failed to see what he stood for. And in their estimate, they would probably conclude that Jesus' death was a noble and quixotic act. But to judge from the state of the world he left behind, ultimately a failure, achieving nothing. Certainly the disciples eventually, after Jesus' death and resurrection, did become those committed apostles who did get it, and by their renewed faith and enthusiasm set their world on fire with the gospel, the good news of God's love for his own creation. But look at us now, the inheritors of that good news, those who try to walk in the footsteps of our Lord and remember his time of temptation and trial in the wilderness. And look at the world outside, busy with its life, and largely ignorant of any of these things. I came across this sentence a while back. The churches are largely empty. The people swarm in the streets and alehouses during service time. 
we who often see ourselves as a fairly powerless force in our society, believing that things were always better, the faithful more numerous, and our country more Christian in days gone by, should be heartened by those words. We might well assume that they speak of the present state of our land, but in fact, they came from a report sent from Lancashire to the Privy Council in 1590, in the reign of Elizabeth I. It seems to us ever thus, there was never an age of piety, but that I had its darker side and its uncommitted multitude. For an encounter with the reality of God is challenging and unsettling. And so many cheap people choose not to take on that possibility. And we can see ourselves so easily just as the dying remnant of a once vibrant and living faith and assume that everything was better in the days gone by. But that would be in itself to defeat God's plan of salvation, for it is a plan which depends in time on each succeeding generation. And now it's our turn not to look back and wish things were as they had been, but to realise that without the past, we would not be able to be here. And without our present, the future generations who are called to keep the flame of faith alive will not be able to be our inheritors. For in each generation, God calls his people to be like salt in food or leaven in the dough, to be lights which cannot be extinguished, the flickering flame which persists in being there. We may feel we're not able to exhibit the same zeal and commitment which the early Christians showed, but our faith is as real and important to us as theirs was. For what we see, looking at the past, is a coherent story, yet each of its threads had to be woven into a pattern as it grew. As it was happening, people must have felt as bewildered and confused and doubting as we feel ourselves to be. And we can begin to see that it isn't just our dilemma that we are unable to see ourselves as a relevant part of the ongoing story of God and his creation. A story which is still ongoing and of which we are just the present chapter. Surely Jesus too would have felt that same sense of doubt, doubt as to whether he was doing any good, whether his great sacrifice of himself to such suffering was going to be successful whether these 11 fairly useless men were going to be any good. He knew that he himself was the living temple through which God's purpose was being fulfilled. But even his closest disciples failed to grasp the reality of the meaning of his life and teaching. So when he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me yet not my will, but your will be done. And when on the cross he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is every bit as, as human and despairing as any sense of failure, doubt and despair we have felt about our faith and our witness to our world. That perhaps sounds a bit presumptuous that we should think of equating our feelings with those of our Lord. But that human weakness is what stops us from following and trusting him as we should and leads us constantly to doubt ourselves, doubt our ability to be the people he has created us to be. Yet we shouldn't, for if the pages of the Bible and the lives of so many ordinary Christians down the ages teach us anything, it is surely that no life lived fully is wasted and that every one of us has a unique place a unique part to play in the bringing in of God's kingdom in our time. For we are those very ones in our generation who have come to realize that the message of the cross is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We are those for whom this world is not just a senseless and meaningless happening in which we find ourselves. Even in this time of ravages of COVID and the restrictions of living, but those who walk to a different drumbeat, who see behind all its pain and brokenness, 
the suffering of a loving creator who will not abandon us and who asks of us only that we share in his love and be those who witness to his presence in the world. And so in spite of the smallness of our numbers and the apparent indifference of most people, we continue to follow our Lord into the wilderness, knowing that only by his, this means can we fulfill the purpose he has for us, that through us, his kingdom will grow on earth and be handed down to succeeding generations. For just as Jesus was driven out into the desert to face the reality of who he was and how he would always have to walk trusting in his father's will and purpose for his life. So we are challenged to let Jesus into our lives as Lord, acknowledging the reality of the God who made us and who loves us so much that he did not shirk from expending his life for us on the cross. For the foolishness of the cross was the only way by which God's wisdom and love could overcome the self-seeking power and violence of humanity. And we, in our turn, here and now, are called to proclaim Christ crucified, the power and wisdom and the everlasting love of God for his creation. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Judith. So as we consider that call to faithfulness, as we grasp hold of and don't shy away from whatever it is God is calling us to do in the interests of his kingdom. So we uh, have a chance now to uh, to join in expressing our um, our devotion to God in the words of this song, as the deer pants for the water.
we make any sort of declaration of faith. Uh, this is not simply a, a list of dry facts that we give our assent to. This is our chance to declare the one in whom we place our trust. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? and makes Christ known in the world. I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm hoping that uh, Mar Margie, Margie is here. That's excellent. Margie, would you lead us in our intercessions? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Lord God, you are always with us. You are with us in the day and in the night. You are with us when we are happy and when we are sad. You are with us when we are healthy and when we are ill. You are with us when we are peaceful and when we are worried. Help us to remember that you love us and that you are with us in everything we do today. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord, who is our refuge and stronghold. For the health and well-being of our nation, that all who are fearful and anxious may be at peace and free from worry. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the isolated and housebound, that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear, hear us. us. Let us pray for our homes and families, our schools and young people, especially at this moment when they're about to return to school. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear, hear us. us. Let us pray for a blessing on our local community, that our neighborhoods may be places of trust and friendship, where all are known and cared for. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear, us. hear us. And finally, the prayer from St. Patrick's breastplate. Plate. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ
Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Father in heaven, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Maggie. We heard earlier on the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so we come to our final hymn, which I will just find for a moment. Lift high the cross. final prayer. Christ, give us grace to grow in holiness, to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us and all those whom we love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Name of Christ. Amen. Amen. But, but before you go, just a chance to share the peace and I'll take this, the slide down. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, and also with you. We offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you. With you. Peace be with you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to shoot off and do another service, but um, the, the, the Zoom room will stay here for a bit. I'm, I'm going to nominate a random person to be host, but when you've had enough, just, uh, just um, sign off and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hello, Rick.